Isaac with the Philistines. The life of Isaac was a faithful mirror of the life of his father. Abraham had to leave his birthplace, so also Isaac. Abraham was exposed to the risk of losing his wife, so also Isaac. The Philistines were envious of Abraham, so also Isaac. Abraham long remained childless, so also Isaac. Abraham begot one pious son and one wicked son, so also Isaac. And finally, as in the time of Abraham, a famine came on the land. At first Isaac intended to follow the example of his father and move to Egypt, but God appeared to him and spoke, You are a perfect sacrifice, without a blemish, and as a burned offering is made unfit if it is taken outside of the sanctuary, so you will be profaned if you should leave the holy land. Remain in the land, and endeavor to cultivate it. In this land dwells the Shekinah, and in days to come, I will give to your children the realms possessed by mighty rulers, first just a part, and the whole in the messianic time. Isaac obeyed the command of God and settled in Gerar. When he noticed that the inhabitants of the place began to have designs on his wife, he followed the example of Abraham and pretended she was his sister. The report of Rebekah's beauty reached the king himself but he remembered the great danger which he had once exposed himself on a similar occasion, and he left Isaac and his Rebekah unmolested. After they had been in Gerar for three months, Abimelech noticed that the manner of Isaac, who lived in the outer court of the royal palace, was that of a husband towards Rebekah. He called him to account, saying, It might have happened that the king himself take the woman you called your sister. Indeed, Isaac lay under the suspicion of having illicit relations with Rebekah, for at first the people of the place believed she was his sister. When Isaac persisted in his lie, Abimelech sent his grandees to him and Rebekah, ordered them to be arrayed in royal vestments, and had it proclaimed before them as they rode through the city. These two are man and wife. He that touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. The king then invited Isaac to settle in his domains. He assigned fields and vineyards to him for cultivation, the best the land afforded. But Isaac was not self-interested. The tithe of all he possessed he gave to the poor of Gerar. Thus he was the first to introduce the law of tithing for the poor, as his father Abraham had been the first to give the priests a portion of his own fortune. Isaac was rewarded by abundant harvests. The land yielded a hundred times more than was expected, though the soil was barren and the vine unfruitful. He grew so rich that the people wished to have the dung from Isaac's mules rather than Abimelech's gold and silver. But his wealth brought forth the envy of the Philistines, for it is characteristic of the wicked that they begrudge their fellow men the good and rejoice when they see evil descend on them. Envy brings hatred in its wake and so the Philistines first envied Isaac, and then hated him. In their hatred toward him, they stopped up the wells which Abraham had had his servants dig. Thus they broke their covenant with Abraham, and were faithless, and they had only themselves to blame if they were exterminated later on by the Israelites. Isaac departed from Gerar, and began again to dig the wells. His reverence for his father was so great that he even restored the names which Abraham had called the wells. To reward him for his filial respect, the Lord left the name of Isaac unchanged, while his father and his son had to submit to new names. After four attempts to secure water, Isaac was successful. He found the well of water that followed the patriarchs. Abraham had obtained it after three diggings, hence the name of the well, Beersheba, the well of seven diggings the same well that will supply water to Jerusalem and its environs in the messianic time. Isaac's success with his wells but served to increase the envy of the Philistines, for he had come on water in a most unlikely spot, and besides, in a year of drought. But the Lord fulfills the desire of them that fear him. As Isaac executed the will of his Creator, so God accomplished his desire. Abimelech, the king, quickly came to see that God was on the side of Isaac. 
to chastise him for having instigated Isaac's removal, his house was ravaged by robbers, and he himself was stricken with leprosy. The wells of the Philistines ran dry as soon as Isaac left Gerar, and the trees failed to yield their fruit. No one could doubt but these things were God's castigation for their unkindness. Now Abimelech entreated his friends, especially the administrator of his kingdom, to accompany him to see Isaac and help win back his friendship. Abimelech and the Philistines spoke to Isaac, We have convinced ourselves that the Shekinah is with you, and therefore we desire you to renew the covenant which your father made with us, that you will do us no harm, as we also did not touch you. Isaac consented. This episode illustrates the character of the Philistines. They pretended it was a good deed for having done him no harm. It also shows they would have been glad to inflict harm on him, for the soul of the wicked desires evil. The place in which the covenant was made between Isaac and the Philistines was called Sheba for two reasons, because an oath was sworn there, and as a memorial to the fact that even the heathen are bound to observe the seven Noachian laws. For all the wonders executed by God for Isaac, and all the good he enjoyed throughout his life, he is indebted to the merits of his father. For his own merits he will be rewarded in the future. On the great day of judgment it will be Isaac who will redeem his descendants from Gehenna. On that day the Lord will speak to Abraham, Your children have sinned. And Abraham will reply, Then let them be wiped out, that your name be sanctified. The Lord will then turn to Jacob, thinking that he who had suffered so much in bringing up his sons would display more love for his posterity. But Jacob will give the same answer as Abraham. Then God will say, The old have no understanding, and the young no counsel. I will now go to Isaac. God will say to him, Your children have sinned. And Isaac will reply, O Lord of the world, say you my children and not thine? When they stood at Mount Sinai and declared themselves ready to execute your bidding before they even heard it, you called them my firstborn. And now they are my children and not yours? Let us consider. The years of a man are seventy. From these, twenty are to be deducted, for you inflict no punishment on those under twenty. Of the fifty years that are left, one half are to be deducted for the nights passed in sleep. Then there remain only twenty-five years, and these are to be diminished by twelve and a half, the time spent in praying, eating, and attending to the other needs of life, during which time men commit no sins. That leaves only twelve and a half years. If you will take these on yourself, well and good. If not, please take one half of them, and I will take the other half. The descendants of Isaac will then say, Truly, you are our true father. But he will point to God and admonish them, No, give not your praises to me, but to God alone. And Israel, with eyes directed towards heaven, will say, You, O Lord, are our father, our redeemer. Everlasting is your name. It was Isaac, or as he is sometimes called, Elihu, the son of Bereshel, who revealed the wonderful mysteries of nature in his arguments with Job. At the end of the years of famine, God appeared to Isaac and bade him to return to Canaan. Isaac did as he was commanded, and he settled in Hebron. At this time, he sent his younger son Jacob to the academy of Shem and Eber to study the law of the Lord. Jacob remained there thirty-two years. As for Esau, he refused to learn and remained in the house of his father. The chase was his only occupation, and as he pursued beasts, so he pursued men, seeking to capture them with cunning and deceit. On one of his hunting expeditions, Esau came to Mount Seir, where he became acquainted with Judith of the family of Ham, and he took her to himself as his wife and brought her to his father at Hebron. Ten years later, when Shem, his teacher, died, Jacob returned home at the age of fifty. Another six years passed, and Rebekah received the joyful news that her sister-in-law, Dinah, the wife of Laban, 
who, like all the women of his house, had been childless until then, had given birth to twin daughters, Leah and Rachel. Rebecca, weary of her life on account of the women chosen by her older son Esau, exhorted Jacob not to marry one of the daughters of Canaan, but rather a girl from the family of Abraham. He assured his mother that the words of Abraham, bidding him to marry no Canaanite, were engraved on his memory, and for this reason he was still unmarried, though he had attained the age of sixty-two, and Esau had been urging him for twenty-two years to follow his example and wed a daughter of the land in which they lived. He had heard that his uncle Laban had daughters, and he resolved to choose one of them as his wife. Deeply moved by the words of her son, Rebekah thanked him and gave praise to God with the words, Blessed be the Lord God, and may his holy name be blessed for ever and ever, who has given me Jacob as a pure son and a holy seed. For he is yours, and yours shall his seed be continually, and throughout all generations forevermore. When the Spirit of the Lord came over her, she laid her hands on the head of Jacob and gave him her maternal blessing. It ended with the words, May the Lord of the world love you, as the heart of your affectionate mother rejoices in you, and may he bless you. Isaac blesses Jacob. Esau's marriage with the daughter of the Canaanites was an abomination not only in the eyes of his mother, but also in the eyes of his father. It is the nature of man to offer less resistance than women to disagreeable circumstances. A bone is not harmed by a collision that would shiver an earthen pot to pieces. Man, who is created out of the dust of the ground, has not the endurance of woman formed out of bone. Isaac was made prematurely old by the conduct of his daughters-in-law, and he lost his sight. Rebecca, who had been accustomed at home in her childhood to the incense burned before idols, could therefore bear it under her own roof. Unlike her, Isaac never had any such experience while he lived with his parents, and he was stung by the smoke arising from the sacrifices offered to the idols by his daughters-in-law. Isaac's eyes had suffered earlier in life, too. When he lay bound on the altar, about to be sacrificed by his father, the angels wept, and their tears fell on his eyes, and there they remained and weakened his sight. At the same time, he had brought the scourge of blindness down on himself by his love for Esau. He justified the wicked for a bribe, the bribe of Esau's filial love, and the loss of vision is the punishment that follows the taking of bribes. A gift, it is said, blinds the eyes of the wise. Nevertheless, his blindness proved a benefit for Isaac as well as for Jacob. In consequence of his physical ailments, Isaac had to stay at home and was so spared the pain of being pointed out by the people as the father of the wicked Esau. And again, if his power of vision had been unimpaired, he would not have blessed Jacob. As it was, God treated him as a physician treats a sick man who is forbidden wine, for which, however, he has a strong desire. To placate him, the physician orders that warm water be given him in the dark, being told that it is wine. When Isaac reached the age of 123 and was thus approaching the years attained by his mother, he began to meditate on his end. It is proper that a man should prepare for death when he comes close to the age at which either of his parents passed out of life. Isaac reflected that he did not know whether the age allotted to him was that of his mother's or his father's, and he therefore resolved to bestow his blessing upon his older son, Esau, before death should overtake him. He summoned Esau and said, My son. And Esau replied, Here I am. But the Holy Spirit interposed, Though he disguises his voice and makes it sound sweet, put no confidence in him. There are seven abominations in his heart. He will destroy seven holy places, the tabernacle, the sanctuaries at Gilgal, Shiloh, Nob, and Gibeon, and the first and second temple. Though Esau continued to speak gently to his father, he actually longed for him to die so he could get the inheritance. But Isaac was stricken with spiritual as well as physical blindness. The Holy Spirit deserted him, and he could not discern the wickedness of his older son. Isaac told Esau to sharpen his slaughtering knives 
and beware of bringing him the flesh of an animal that had died of sickness or had been killed by a beast. He also warned against bringing an animal that had been stolen from its rightful owner. Then, continued Isaac, I will bless him who is worthy of being blessed. This charge was laid on Esau on the eve of the Passover, and Isaac said to him, Tonight the whole world will sing the Hallel to God. It is the night when the storehouses of dew are unlocked. Therefore, prepare dainties for me, that my soul may bless you before I die. But the Holy Spirit interposed, Eat not the bread of him that has the evil eye. Isaac's longing for tidbits was due to his blindness. As the sightless cannot behold the food they eat, they do not enjoy it with full relish. So their appetite must be tempted with tasty morsels. Esau sallied forth to procure his father's desire, little caring how he got it, whether by robbery or theft. To hinder the quick execution of his father's order, God sent Satan on the chase with Esau. He was to delay him as long as possible. Esau would catch a deer and leave him lying tied up while he pursued other game. Immediately, Satan would come and free the deer and when Esau returned to the spot, his victim was not to be found. This was repeated several times. Again and again the quarry was run down, bound, and liberated, so that Jacob was able, meanwhile, to carry out the plan of Rebekah, by which he would be blessed instead of Esau. Though Rebekah had not heard the words passed between Isaac and Esau, they nevertheless were revealed to her by the Holy Spirit and she resolved to prevent her husband from taking a false step. She was not prompted by her love for Jacob, but by the wish of keeping Isaac from committing a detestable mistake. Rebekah said to Jacob, Tonight the storehouses of dew are unlocked, and it is the night during which the celestial beings chant the Hillel to God, the night set apart for deliverance of your children from Egypt, on which they too will sing the Hillel. Go now, and prepare savory meat for your father, that he may bless you before his death. Do as I bid you, obey me, for you are my son, and your children, every one, will be good and God-fearing. Not one shall be graceless. In spite of his great respect for his mother, Jacob refused at first to heed her command. He feared he might commit a sin, thus bringing his father's curse down on him. Even as it was, Isaac might still have a blessing for him after giving Esau his. But Rebekah set aside his anxieties with the words, When Adam was cursed, the malediction fell on his mother, the earth. And so shall I, your mother, bear the suffering if your father curses you. Moreover, if worse comes to worse, I am prepared to step before your father and tell him, Esau is a villain and Jacob is a righteous man. Thus instructed by his mother, Jacob, in tears and stooped with sadness, went off to execute the plan. As he was to provide a Passover meal, she told him to get two lambs, one for the Passover sacrifice and one for the festival sacrifice. To soothe Jacob's conscience, she added that her marriage contract entitled her to two lambs daily. And, she continued, these two lambs will bring good to you, one the blessing of your father, the other will bring good to your children, for two lambs will be the atoning sacrifice offered on the Day of Atonement. Jacob's fear was not yet removed. His father, he thought, would touch him and find out that he was not hairy, and therefore not his son Esau. Accordingly, Rebekah tore the skins of the two lambs into strips and sewed them together, for Jacob was so tall a giant that otherwise they would have not covered his hands. To make Jacob's disguise complete, Rebekah felt justified in putting Esau's wonderful garments on him. They were the high priestly raiment in which God had clothed Adam, the firstborn of the world. For in the days before the construction of the tabernacle, all firstborn males officiated as priests. From Adam, these garments descended to Noah, to Shem, and Shem to Abraham, and Abraham to his son Isaac from whom they reached Esau as the elder of his two sons. It was the opinion of Rebekah that, as Jacob had bought the birthright from his brother, 
he had thereby come into possession of the garments as well. There was no need for her to go to the house of Esau to fetch the clothes. He knew his wives far too well to entrust so precious a treasure to them. They were in the safe keeping of his mother. Besides, he used them most frequently in the house of his parents. As a rule, he did not lay much stress on decent apparel. He was willing to appear on the street clad in rags, but he considered it his duty to wait on his father arrayed in his best. My father, Esau was in the habit of saying, is a king in my sight, and it would not become me to serve him in anything but royal apparel. To this great respect he manifested towards his father, the descendants of Esau owe all their good fortune on earth. For God does reward a good deed. Rebekah led Jacob equipped and dressed in this way to the door of Isaac's chamber. There she parted from him with the words, From here may your Creator assist you. Isaac was expecting Esau. Jacob entered, addressing Isaac with, Father, and receiving the response, Here I am. Who are you, my son? He replied, It is I. He sought to avoid a falsehood, and yet not betray that he was Jacob. Isaac then said, You are in great haste to secure your blessing. Your father Abraham was seventy-five years old when he was blessed, and you were but sixty-three. Jacob replied awkwardly, Because the Lord our God has sent me good speed. Isaac concluded at once that this was not Esau, for he would not have mentioned the name of God, and he made up his mind to feel the sun before him and make sure who he was. Terror seized on Jacob at the words of Isaac, Come near, I pray you, that I may touch you. Cold sweat covered his body, and his heart melted like wax. Then God caused the archangels Michael and Gabriel to descend. The one seized his right hand, the other his left, while the Lord himself supported him, that his courage might not fail. Isaac felt him, and finding his hands hairy, he said, The voice is Jacob's, but the hands are the hands of Esau. Words in which he conveyed the prophecy that so long as the voice of Jacob is heard in the house of prayer and learning, the hands of Esau will not be able to prevail against him. Yes, he continued, it is the voice of Jacob, the voice that imposes silence on earth and in heaven. For even the angels may not raise their voices in praise of God until Israel has finished his prayers. Isaac's scruples about blessing the son before him were not yet removed, for with his prophetical eye he saw that this one would have descendants who would vex the Lord. At the same time, it was revealed to him that even the sinners in Israel would turn penitent, and then he was ready to bless Jacob. He bade him to come near and kiss him, to indicate that it would be Jacob who would imprint the last kiss on Isaac before he was consigned to the grave, he and no other. When Jacob stood close to him, Isaac discerned the fragrance of paradise clinging to him, and he exclaimed, See! The smell of my son is as the smell of the field which the Lord has blessed. The fragrance emanating from Jacob was not the only thing about him derived from paradise. The archangel Michael had fetched the wine which Jacob gave his father to drink, that an exalted mood might descend on him, for only when a man is joyously excited does the Shekinah rest on him. The Holy Spirit filled Isaac, and he gave Jacob his tenfold blessing. God give you the dew of heaven, the celestial dew from which God will awaken the pious to new life in the days to come, and of the fatness of the earth, the goods of this world, and plenty of corn and wine, the Torah and the commandments which bestow the same joy on man as abundant harvests. Peoples shall serve you, the Japhethites and the Hamites, Nations shall bow down to you, the Shemite nations. You will be lord over your brethren, the Ishmaelites and the descendants of Keturah, Hagar. Your mother's sons will bow down to you, Esau and his princes. Cursed be everyone that curses you, like Balaam, 
and blessed be everyone that blesses you, like Moses. For each blessing invoked on Jacob by his father Isaac, a similar blessing was bestowed on him by God himself in the same words. As Isaac blessed him with dew, so also God. And the remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many peoples, as dew from the Lord. Isaac blessed him with the fatness of the earth, so also God. And he shall give the rain of your seed, that you shall sow the ground, and it shall be fat and plenteous. Isaac blessed him with plenty of corn and wine, so also God. I will send you corn and wine. Isaac said, Peoples shall serve you, so also God. Kings shall nurse you, and their queens also. They will bow down to you with faces to the earth. To this double blessing his mother Rebekah joined hers. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. They shall bear you up in their hands, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread on the lion and the snake. The Holy Spirit added in turn, He shall call on me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Jacob left the presence of his father crowned like a bridegroom, adorned like a bride, and bathed in celestial dew, which filled his bones with marrow and transformed him into a hero and a giant. Of another miracle done for him on that very moment, Jacob himself was not aware. Had he lingered with his father an instant longer, Esau would have found him there, and surely would have killed him. It happened that exactly as Jacob was on the point of leaving the tent of his father, carrying in his hands the plates off which Isaac had eaten, he noticed Esau approaching, and he concealed himself behind the door. Fortunately, it was a revolving door, so that though he could see Esau, he could not be seen by him. Next, Esau's True Character Revealed End Part 18 of 95 TheLegendsOfTheJews.com